All right, welcome back to another episode of Nature's Always Right. Today, we're sitting down for an interview with the two guys behind Bootstrap Farmer. So I'm here with Brandon and Nick. Thank you guys so much for sitting down with me. Sure. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's always a pleasure talking with you guys and exchanging ideas. And um, so we're gonna learn a lot from them today and uh, learn about their business too. So you know, the first thing I just wanna introduce you guys. So what is Bootstrap Farmer? Who are you guys? And what are you all about? Well, Bootstrap Farmer has become a lot of things, but we really started out and became known uh, for our heavy duty trays, our mm. high tunnel kits. That's how I found you, the 1020 trays. That's yeah, how I found right. You. Yeah. I mean, we're solving a need there because mm -hmm. those, you know, I was breaking those trays left and right as I was building my farm up, and I was just like, is there a heavy duty version of this? Because there should be. Yeah. And there wasn't. And uh, because I was building my farm to create the business for myself, I was already kind of feeling entrepreneurial and risky and so just decided to make that heavy duty tray. That's cool. So that was the first product? It wasn't actually the first product. As when I was building the high tunnel first, it was the wire, the channel and, and the hand crank because when I went to order them it was like a four week shipping time. Mm. I just felt like it was way too expensive and so I was just like, this ain't right. And, and so like just looked into it a little bit and uh, saw a little opportunity. I had basically a $5,000 emergency fund, which I shouldn't have touched yeah. and decided just to go for it. And, uh, <laughs> that was, you know, that's how bootstrap farmer, the name came to be because I was out there. I saved all my money to build that, that high tunnel. And, mm -hmm. you know, every penny was important to me. And so bending the hoops, doing it all of myself. And, um, that's what I felt like it, the name came to me immediately because mm -hmm. I was a bootstrapping farmer. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love that. I know, you know a lot of us are like that. I know if you've seen how I developed my farm, a lot of my stuff, it's made from recycled materials, what I had on hand. I didn't have a ton of money starting out uh, with my farm. And that's why I really like, you know, their philosophy of, you know, use what you have and, you know, save every penny you can. So that's something that they really bring to the table. Um, but at the same time, everything that they do is really high quality. Because they know, because they farm, they both are farmers. They know that we need uh, stuff that's going to last and work really well for us. Mm -hmm. We're all trying to run an efficient operation, and when those things are breaking on you and you expect them to, or you're wasting money by buying new ones yes. every year, yeah. and like we're all trying to have our positive impact on the world. And so, yes, they're plastic trays, but they're plastic trays you're going to use for years to mm -hmm. come. And right. so I, I like to think that we're saving lots of plastic mm -hmm. from landing in landfill. And they're food grade too, I mm -hmm. believe, Absolutely, right? you can throw them in the dishwasher even. Yeah, really, wow, yep. that's really cool. Now you just need a dishwasher. Yeah, I need a dishwasher, <laughs> yeah, if I only had a dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> so I also wanna to touch on your guys' podcast. Um, it's one that I listen to all the time and I've gained a lot of benefit from. Um, you guys you know, talk about marketing, a lot of things that helping, I guess, more on the business side, where a lot of these other farming podcasts are really focused on the, the detailed nitty gritty of either no-till farming, the actual techniques behind a lot. I mean, you guys do talk about that as well, but something I find very valuable about yours is that um, it helps me on like the business marketing in a lot. Yeah. So yeah. Tell us about that. I mean, the thing about us deciding to go that direction is, the guys that are talking about the actual how to grow, they're doing such a good job. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know if Brandon and I either like fully said that, you know, admitted that we were farmers. For us, it was always a business first and then mm -hmm. the farm yeah. second. And so uh, both of our farms were predicated on added value products and, and system based things and, and uh, a whole set of efficiencies around business. And that's, kind of what we know the best and you know that's that's what we chose to talk about and that it's just seemed like such a, a wide area that needed to be covered mm -hmm. and like like yeah. i said the guys that are that are covering the how to grow mm -hmm. hey they're, they're, they're doing such a good job so yeah. absolutely and different things like help us break through to like get past the initial hurdles and for me especially it was it was all in my head it was like that mindset game mm -hmm. and i just yeah. know how much that's transform transformed my life give me a new sense of responsibility and purpose and all of that. And if I can help someone get along and, and that, that I, that's the impact I'd like to make, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great point about mindset. It's, um, they're just having the confidence to do it or, you know, hearing someone else's story too. It's like, well, man, they did it and they had all these problems and yeah, I guess I could do it too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mean, the, the, 
the, you need all the growing knowledge, but if you yes. don't have the confidence to push through, carry forward, mm -hmm. all of that kind of all, it's all built on a, sh a shaky foundation anyway, so. Yeah. The neat thing about Brandon and I is we're both, before we met, we're doing pretty much the same thing, mm -hmm. but coming at it from two different angles. We both had food trucks, we both had commercial kitchens, and, and mm -hmm. we're taking our stuff from what we were growing and turning it into meals, and I was doing drinks and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, he was coming from a, very much from a health and ecological standpoint, and I was coming from it like I wanted my food to be better. Mm -hmm. So I was growing for ingredients. Yeah, you know, and that's I, I think us taking a culinary position on things and figuring out how farming fit into those models mm -hmm. instead of taking farming and fitting it into something else. Uh, it was it was a part of the process instead of the end all and be all of what we were doing. Mm -hmm. and, totally. uh, I think what's cool about uh, natural farming is that the food tastes better. So it goes hand in hand with the culinary side of it. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, that's interesting. Oh, yeah, I want to ask you guys um, about more about, I guess, kind of your food service businesses because these guys have done a lot of really interesting things that other people aren't doing. Um, like, I know Brandon right now has the prepared uh, food service. Could you tell us a little bit about yep. what's it's going on with that? It's a meal subscription service. And yeah. so, you know, I've been using this term farm fusion a lot because I feel like we can have this new cuisine because it's a global community now. I think everyone's aware of Indian, Asian, and Mexican mm -hmm. and all that. And so, I, I think we should start taking a look at like what's local first. And then if we can create that into a meal and provide you know, a little bit of everything because my personal taste, I get bored real quick. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to have a food service like my cafe or my meal subscription service, people don't want tacos every night. People don't want just ramen every night or pizza every night. They want a mix of those things. Yeah. And so I didn't want to pigeonhole myself into like vegan Italian and yes. local. Like that's, yeah, it's too much. that's not fun for me. And so it's fun to do all these different things. And, mm -hmm. you know, being in rural North Carolina, I, I'm not in San Francisco. I'm not competing with Michelin chefs. And so, you know, I feel uh, competent and confident enough in my abilities to have started that business. And now that I got so many other projects going on, brought in another farm who, another term I like is farm chef. Like we yeah. grow and we cook and we turn that into a meal. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of people out there that want to do that, whether that's one person or a husband and wife team. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I'm trying to do is you know, through Vegetable, the meal subscription services, yes. is sort of be that model and say, hey, like, I'm just a guy and, and I did it. Mm -hmm. Put the food truck on your property, bring your own things in, have a couple other local farms and start the menu there. Yeah. And I think that's very possible and doable. And again, I did it all on my savings. And so wow. that, that was that bootstrapping attitude mm -hmm. I was taking because it, mm -hmm. it forced that efficiency, you know, that having all those middlemen taken out where I'm growing it, I'm cooking it, I'm delivering it to the customer. Right. You know, it's I own the whole supply chain. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, and I've noticed um, just like in my Instagram or online, there's a lot more of these uh, prepared food businesses coming up, just small mom and pop people and they're, you know, they have a kitchen or they have a, a, even a commercial kitchen. They're preparing these foods and, you know, doing home deliveries or delivering it to the gym or these different things. And I think that's another, avenue for us small market farmers to sell to so they know in 2019 that is another little market that i kind of want to test out this year and uh, see if it has any possibilities for us because you know typically in the past it's just been farmers markets restaurants csa just private customers mm -hmm. and that was it but now you know i'm seeing a lot more avenues opening up well the way people are interacting with food service has changed um, mm -hmm. the market's been primed by like hello fresh and yes, and yeah. blue apron Absolutely. so it's it's now been told that it's acceptable uh, to get food delivered or to get meals meal prep services that aren't just centered around some specific diet like mm -hmm. this can fit into your everyday life mm -hmm. and there's nobody out there saying hey Steven, as a farmer, you can't do this as well. Yeah. You just, you have to develop the systems, the infrastructure, mm -hmm. you have to make sure that the market is there and, and will, willing to accept it before you go down that road. Right. You know, and that, and that comes into being in tune with what's going on in your area and what people are more apt to get. Totally. Uh, mm -hmm. My food service was, was very similar. Yeah. Uh, we, did, we did a weekly subscription salad to offices. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and with that, 
we weren't trying to sell to the whole town. We were trying to sell to a very specific niche that we filled and that was right for us. It was right for them. And when we went to the farmer's market, we had a whole separate client, you know, and, and at the end, I, I, I did sell uh, my farm and my other businesses back to my employees back in September. But um, at the farmer's market, we wound up doing uh, mocktails, like oh. herb infused, like we were making our own sodas and tinctures yeah, and tonics and all that stuff. That yeah. So with, with that, that was a lot of fun for me. That was my passion, oh. but it was also something I could share with the community that was very well taken. The margins were great. Mm -hmm. But when, when we set up Craven, it, it didn't go very well at his spot. Versus if I would have done the stuff that he's doing with, with the vegan and, and all that stuff back where I'm at, man, it would have fallen on its face. Interesting. So it's, yeah. it's, it's really understanding who in the market you're trying to serve and, and making sure that you're in tune with that. Not necessarily what I want to eat or what I want to do, but who the people are out there that's willing to buy it and support it. Right? And that highlights something important that we've always wanted to focus on is having a flexible and adaptable business. Because mm -hmm. like, we all kind of have like tunnel vision at the beginning, I'm gonna go do this, and you buy all this equipment, yeah. and things kind of change. Chefs start making requests over, over here, but you didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like the people who lean into that and are adaptable enough seem to be the ones that figure it out. Yeah, I mean, that's like, that's a sign of a good business, right? It's agile and it can shift when it needs to, and that's how you survive. You know, and I made the mistake, you know, I've, I've owned several businesses and I've gone down the road where, hey, let's invest a bunch of infrastructure and then the pivot or two or three has to change. And now we're stuck with equipment we don't need, which in landscaping can get very expensive really quick. Oh, yeah. You know, and that market's so saturated, it's not like you can get rid of that stuff. Similar to if, if you were to, to get a specialty piece of uh, kitchen equipment, mm. you know, use kitchen equipment, it's cheap. Yeah, we should. You know, so it's it's one of those things, if, if you do sell it, you're not gonna get you know what you paid for it. Yeah. So you have to be real good, like mm. I'm dedicated to doing this and it's gonna work. Interesting. Yeah, it's like testing out the market ahead of time. And For sure. Really seeing what's what's gonna be possible is important. Yep. Yeah, it's a good message. We recorded a podcast earlier today about shared kitchens. You know, don't don't buy yeah. your own kitchen, buy into yeah. a shared kitchen. Right. Like, new possibilities are available now. And that's another thing that we want to highlight, like through our products, like the, the heavy duty five by five, like subscription programs, zero waste programs. Mm -hmm. Like we want to be ahead of the curve and you know the, the same thing is like technology has changed things. Yeah. More is possible with our phone, more control of the yeah. supply chain and reaching customers efficiently is now in our hands. And yeah. we just want to highlight like, like, look, like it's changed. Like, let's be aware of like, mm -hmm. we're all clicking on Amazon, buy on one button. We should have those same expectations now mm -hmm. when dealing with our customers. We should make yeah. it that easy for our customers. Yeah, I think it's a great point about that. We now control the whole supply chain because of the internet. Like the internet, what it did is it killed the middleman. And now we can be the middleman too, or well, there is no middleman. We just go direct to the consumer. Well, it also allows the small farmer to retain sales 24-7. Yeah. So one thing that's very interesting, if you look at our infrastructure for Bootstrap, a lot of our orders come in from like midnight to 6 a.m. It's, it's crazy. Interesting. But that tells me that just like our consumers, farmers are up, they're shopping after hours, they're shopping Mm -hmm. when they're sitting in bed or whatever mm -hmm. our customers are doing the same thing it's yeah. if if you've wow. ever ordered anything as a farmer off regular hours off online your customers are too yeah. so the lesson there is don't miss a sale just because you refuse to put up a paywall somewhere or that that you're you're leery about using your phone for commerce it's it's it's, it's a big deal. It's, yeah it's it's just what is now and yeah you know, kind of we've got to accept it and <laughs> embrace it and and it's awesome because it's it's um It'll make us very successful. Well, and here's the thing. If if you don't do that for your own business, somebody else is going to do yeah, it for right. you. Yes. And all the consumers now, because now they've been trained by Blue Apron and Easy Fresh and Fresh and Amazon, like we're being so trained for convenience and ease of, you know, so if we need to provide that now too. If we don't, we're going to get outcompeted. Um, and if we care about, you know, really healthy food and the environment and these things, we it's up to us to step forward and provide that service that all our consumers want. You know, it's not enough anymore to sit around and wait for your consumers to come to you. Yeah. You have to go to where they're at. You have to go to the platforms that are at. You have to speak the way that they speak and want to be spoken to. And you have to meet them more than halfway nowadays because mm -hmm. so many people are out there in the marketplace. And look, farming is not a saturated market. There's a lot of farmers out there 
but everybody is bringing something so different to the table, mm -hmm. but it's up to each farmer to realize what their possibilities are and what they could bring mm -hmm. and to lean on those and, and be okay with, hey, you get your tomatoes from me and you get your greens from this guy because, yeah, you know, I don't grow great greens and, and this guy does and, and mm -hmm. to work together. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a lot of what we talk about is yes. collaborative efforts. Yeah. yeah. And we're looking past capturing, you know, attention, you know, we will, we want to capture attention by not standing on a soapbox, but providing convenience, providing an experience that reconnects them with local food. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, like we have the living grow rack, rack in our cafe yeah. and just being able to see, oh, that's going to be next week's microgreen salad. Yeah. That's like different. And it's yeah. like people think, or a lot of kids think that the produce comes from the grocery store. Right. Well, actually in the future, some of it is going to come from the grocery mm. store. So it is kind of going full circle. So it is a way to reconnect, you know, how things are growing, how, where things arrive and come from. Yeah, that's a great point. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm really excited to see what you guys are going to do with your grow racks and how they're going to be incorporated into restaurants and bars and uh, grocery stores. So it'll be really, really exciting. Yeah. Uh, so talking about collaboration and, um, you know, farmers trying out new things, you guys also do something called farm incubators. Uh, could you tell us more about that and you know, the whole concept behind it and how it works? Yeah, and that it's really part of the whole adaptability and flexibility of your farm business. And so, you know, we play this, we talked about this idea of having a, a 10 foot by 20 foot greenhouse and like yes. all the different things that allows you to do. You have a little microgreen station mm -hmm. or you can fill it with grow bags and do like a grow bag subscription thing where mm -hmm. you're trading out seasonal bags for people's porches and stuff. So. It was just one of those things, it's like every farm needs a small covered space yes. anyway. Let's present like 10 different plans that you can, and, and sure, some of it is with bootstrap products, but only because like that's the stuff I use and the stuff that I use to make money, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So um, it's like microgreens didn't really work out. You thought you tested the market, cool. You still have your yeah. house. You still need to produce seedlings for the field. Yeah. And, and, still, and yeah. maybe you switch over to tomatoes and peppers mm -hmm. and, and you go to the beta buckets or something. It just, and that's not like a huge cost. You know what I'm saying? It, it's reasonable. And so we just wanted people to like allow them to envision possibilities for themselves. And so the incubator is just a lot of things that we've done in the past on our own, sharing our own experiences. And then through the early interviews on the podcast, you know, asking people about their experiences because right. we all know how it is when you're sitting in the office and you're like, oh, I gotta get out of this nine to five. And you go down all the different rabbit holes, permaculture, aquaponics, hydroponics, and you know, the universe is your oyster. And it's like the hardest part is choosing which one and then knowing what to focus on the most. Yeah. And so having that clarity of vision is what everyone is seeking. Mm -hmm. And so I, feel, I, you know, I, I understand that pain. I understand that need because I went through it. And the blog and the incubator and the things that are going to come after, which are even bigger than that, are all designed to help someone, you know, crystallize their own vision for themselves. The other thing about the incubator is it's a numbers breakdown. So a lot of people, you know, they, they, they'll use the six figures as, okay, if I can do six figures, everything's okay. It's just an arbitrary number because it doesn't equate... Uh, your your cost and all yeah. that other thing, but but if we use that as a as a benchmark for success, you know, breaking down a hundred thousand dollars by fifty two weeks, by how many sales per week do you need to? It's it's really not that much, and and I think most farmers can can realize a hundred to one hundred and fifty customers that were are buying from you a, a series of goods every single week or most of the weeks throughout the year. You know, if you start breaking those numbers up and, and plugging that into the calendar, well, you know, you 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 don't automatically have to make a hundred thousand dollar sale, right. and that's what it feels like. Yeah. But when you start breaking those down by calendar days or by square footage mm -hmm. in the greenhouse, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, I have this many grow bags, and these grow bags are going to sell four or five turns a year at X amount. Well, there's it, it all starts adding up. Yeah. You know, so it's it's the ability to take your square foot realize your production amounts and then figure out your cost mm -hmm. and, and say, okay, well, I know that I can go out per week and, and at least do 50 orders. Well, what else extra are you going to have to do through marketing and through networking and, and doing stuff social, like, like, you know, what we're going to do tonight, mm -hmm. do you have to go out and do to get the other 50, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it makes it seem really plausible at that point. Not that it's not work and not that it's, not going to be difficult days, but breaking those down into those 
attainable weekly goals and attainable, I can grow 50 bags mm -hmm. or I can grow X amount of flats. And I know I can sell, you know, within that time frame. It just, it, it turns those question marks into, yeah. I can do that per week. I can do that again per week. Especially if you start doing some of the like subscription models and, mm -hmm. and seasonal things and mm -hmm. retaining the same customers. Uh, yeah, I like that idea of breaking down the year into weeks and it, and the small, it's these smaller chunks that are a lot easier to uh, digest. And if, if, you know, if you just project the whole year, I gotta make a hundred grand. It but seems like the most yes, possible. It's crazy. It's, like, it's a big mountain. It's not a yeah. step at a time. Right. Yeah, and I don't know for me as a, as a small farmer on a small land base, um, I always recommend just because you need it. You need to have multiple revenue streams going at all times. You can't just, just grow salad greens. You can't just grow root crops. You can't just grow microgreens. I mean, you can. There's lots of very successful people doing it. But I I like the idea of having multiple streams because if something fails, you have a crop failure in the field. You have a mold outbreak in your microgreens. You know, you've got these different areas where you're pulling revenue from every week so that you know, your business is still afloat and you're, you're bringing in revenue every single week. I mean, imagine you were a commercial <laughs> romaine grower. Yes, yeah, yeah those I mean, guys. Like you don't, yeah. it's like, if that were only 20% of your business, well, you're right. it's gonna be management, but I'm sure there's some growers that have gone bankrupt due to that probably. outbreak. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, that's a great point. The other thing about the diversified income streams is making sure that that fits into your, your how you want to live your life. So Brandon talks a lot about lifestyle design and, and we look at beyond the farming and beyond the business, you know, what does your personal life look like and can you have a personal life while mm -hmm. still maintaining a business and making sure that you have that balance on both sides. Mm -hmm. And instead of having to worry about that financial goal that, you know, is, is out there somewhere, you know, well, I can take two weeks off and schedule that in because, mm -hmm. well, I, I know we're going to be in between season or mm -hmm. I know that the farmers and market's going to be not open for X amount of time. And you can adjust those numbers that we had to hit a few minutes ago yeah. to spend time with the family or to spend right. time on self-improvement or to spend time, you know, maintaining other things in your life other than just the farm. You know, yeah. that's having that balance is and that recharging time and that time to work on yourself is pretty important. It is. And a lot of farmers burn out because we don't take the time to plan out those. those yeah, and all three of us are guilty of it. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Big time. Big time. I mean, we're not, we're not sitting here saying this because we read it in the book. I mean, yeah. you know, we've been burned out for years, you know, right. so, <laughs> so, so that's why it's so important for us to get that message out because mm. it's, it's, you can mitigate it yeah. if you're aware of it, but sometimes you just, you start a business and everything is so exciting and you're yeah. doing it for the freedom. And then you look up sometimes and, and you're being constricted yeah. because everything is going back into the business and, and it's very easy to get in that trap. So we just like to bring awareness that it has to fit into your lifestyle that you want. And the lifestyle that you want doesn't mean that you're driving a Land Rover, you know what I mean? It's, right. it's whatever you right. define freedom as and, and really taking the time to sit and define that freedom. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about this a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, what is freedom? And, and freedom is so many things to so many different people, but mm -hmm. I think having that self-awareness as to what you want out of life and what you can give to your community and how that can all fit and play together. It's a big deal. Yeah, that's really well said. Yep. You know, I, I remember when I was in the corporate environment still, I was kind of on my soapbox about, you know, what is freedom and yeah. freedom is not working for the man. Yeah. And, you know, intelligent coworker of mine said, you know what, you know, freedom for me is being able to go home and do whatever I want. Mm. And I was like, hey, respect. Yeah. You know, he, he can go out, out on the weekends and, and do whatever and just not worry about work. And, you know, when you're working for your business, your work is you it's always, it's yeah. always here. And so, yeah, that's something I realized about it's the entrepreneurial curse. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. I think it's we have to respect and honor people's why they are where they are. Yeah. Maybe that's where they want to be. And, and hey, to each his own. That's mm -hmm. cool. Like, and, and I totally but, get it. But I think like we have to be self-aware enough to know mm -hmm what are you actually working towards? And so if we can be aware enough to, to want to know where our end goals are, mm -hmm. we can deconstruct that and be mindful throughout the process that that's actually where we're, we're trying to head. Yeah. I mean, some people will look at us and be like, God oh, dang, I mean, it's, it's nonstop, but we love it. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, and, and look, we're, we're doing this because we like the journey of doing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, someday we, we may not be as fortunate to be able to do these things, you know, so getting older every minute, you know, That's so, right. but uh, we're just enjoying it as it is. And this is what we truly want to do right now. And, right. We were just talking about yesterday. It's like, we're not worried about the end goal because this right here is 
Right. This is awesome. Yeah. And it's to be able to appreciate that now as it's happening is pretty damn neat because yeah. If we were to look back in five years and go, man, that was awesome what we were doing. But like right now, we're like, man, this is awesome because we're having such a good time. And and I think we're at a good time in farming right now because I think we kind of got over that hump of, you know, now it's okay to work with other people. Now it's okay mm -hmm. to go get some education while, yeah. you know, even as little as, let's say, three years ago, whenever courses first started coming out in farming, there was such recoil about well, I don't want to give up my money to go learn something. It's going to make me 10 times more. I mean, that wasn't the narrative, but yeah. that, that's what's happening. Yeah. And so now that some people have gone through those early classes and it has, has accepted that, you know, it's worth my time to go do this. Yeah. And I'm, I'm talking about other people's courses here that I've gone and taken, and they're now coming back and reporting that, yes, they are successful mm -hmm. in varying degrees that are happy with them. Yeah. You know, we're, we're in a spot where it's easy to connect. I mean, mm -hmm. 20 years ago, we would have never met. No, you know? yeah. we wouldn't have been sharing the secrets that we are either. Because yeah. that's how farmers used to kind of think, like, oh, I, did, I grow my tomatoes this way, and I don't want to tell you like, right. how I do it. Because right. that is kind of local competition <laughs> yeah. in that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and there's a, there's a, a phrase that I, that I love when people say it's, you know, just because you're winning does not mean that I'm losing. Right, and that's vice versa. 100%. Yeah. And if we're working together, look, if I have a bad week and you have a good week and then we flip next week, you know, net score yeah everybody wins mm -hmm. the consumers win mm -hmm. local economy wins each farmer wins everybody wins in this scenario but it takes people being willing to be collaborative yeah. and it takes people willing to hey i'm going to give up a little bit early on or i'm gonna i've got mine for the last few months i'm going to do something to help somebody else because the stronger that local economy is the better i mean really the better mm -hmm. it is absolutely and what i like about you know what the synergy that we have is like we have an abundance mindset and we want to show off the best of capitalism mm -hmm. you know like the capitalism is a loaded word for a lot of people yeah. and it can send people in all kinds of directions but like we want to show like a, a profitable business model that can impact the world Absolutely. and that is possible within capitalism yes. and so you know we're, we're, we're all trying to push that ball mm -hmm. forward and i accept that challenge it's like We've been, this is the rules of the game that we've been handed. It's like a monopoly board. Mm -hmm. You're confined to the rules of monopoly. And so capitalism is the game that we're playing in. Mm -hmm. So let's learn how to play within that game and maximize our impact that way. Yeah, and I think that we're doing a pretty successful job at it. And I love seeing every year he gets more and more collaborative and it just keeps growing. So um, it's awesome. I keep seeing more and more younger and new farmers that never even considered growing or being involved in this arena. And now they're, they are because all these people have put forward these different business models over the last like 10 years, the courses, the, the brand new tools that are on the market, you know, this endless how much help uh, that we've all given each other just by sharing everything. You know, and, yeah. and just like Brandon and I, Peter, people are, are, are coming into food for different reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. and, and that that variety is really good for the clients because they're introduced to new foods and mm -hmm. they're, they're introduced to new ways of cooking and to new vegetables and you know, as, as heirloom varieties kind of, you know, got popular again mm -hmm. and, and as new uh, field grown and field trialed stuff kind of came into production, it's really opened the doors for a, a lot of different culinary skills to come yeah. to the forefront. And, it, and it's like the, the, the farm chef that, that Brandon's kind of coined, it's, uh -huh. it's bringing the best of those both worlds mm -hmm. to a market that again has been primed to accept yes. and be willing to buy and pay for these things. Yeah. yeah. Just think about how many uh, Netflix sh chef and cooking shows it's there are. Stop, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's, it's, big. it's so big. And, and that whole term, like farm chef, just really speaks to this that skill stacking mm -hmm. that uh, Scott Adams coined. You know, the, the Dillard guy. Mm -hmm. and, and if you can stack two skills, like you know, he wasn't the best uh, cartoonist, but he wasn't the best comedian either. Mm -hmm. But he was in the top ten percent of both, and so mm -hmm. that created a uniqueness in the market, which you know, create a space for himself. And mm -hmm. we just think with technology and all these apps and everything, it's like, I never felt like I had to just grow things. Mm. It was, I just I had my mind open that I can just do anything. And I, mm. I think because we've been been able to do on, on, on our scale, it's like, we just want to show that possibility to others. And so you don't really know what's possible sometimes until someone shows you or tells you or mm. says like, hey dude, I'm just a guy, I'm not that yeah, special, exactly. but I did it. Yeah. And so, like, that's how we can inspire because, you know, we're boots on the ground doing it, you know. Exactly.
I love that. Guy. I'm just a guy. That that is what it is. Or I'm just a girl. Who whatever you know. So five years ago, I was person. I was not confident. I was yeah. I was sitting in the office wondering, I'm a fraud. How how can I how can I be here? I don't belong here. I mean, I was in like a nice financial firm. Mm -hmm. I just feel like I didn't have any business there. And so like not living my truth or my passion or whatever it just yeah. my confidence was so low and yeah. just yeah. bit by bit it was podcasts that like I, I just heard the right people saying like the same things i'm saying now and just gave me that just enough to be like all right i'm gonna start looking on the internet all right mm. i'm gonna book a training course in colorado so now i put money on the line and so that it's like you don't just go all in all at once there's kind of, there has to be like this building process yeah. for, for yourself uh, to, to really build up to that. And that's why we like practical measured approaches too and building yourself, building your business and, and not going crazy all at once because you've got to build a strong foundation first. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, and, and to, to your point about not feeling, I didn't realize what we were doing with added value food stuff was mm -hmm. significant until I started getting asked to speak about it mm -hmm. at, you know, farm yeah. events. and. I mean, even now I mean, we, we host a podcast that's, you know, you know, oftentimes two times a week and oftentimes I go, you know, who, nobody has given us the authority to speak other than other people want to hear what we're doing. And it's like, you know what, if we, if we get on the mic this week and we look like a fool, then we look like a fool. But the emails that we get and the calls that we get where we've actually helped, you know, one or two people that week, that's really, it would be a disservice to not do that yeah. it, you know despite you know the the risk of of sounding like an idiot sometimes yeah. you know it's it's like we have to do this because we've been asked to do this by somebody else and yeah. it just, i feel the same way with my videos too it's like when people say oh wow you helped me figure out how to do this or i'm going to start trying to grow or be a commercial grower because of your videos and yeah and that's and the only thing you see is your hair is out of place or something like I mean, yeah you know, right. it's like I, but yeah but it's just like you know i just started doing it and i learned and then you know and you so, get better every week, and, yes. and that's the thing. The podcast has gotten better because we're learning, and we're yeah. always look. We're always learning how to do yes. something different or new, yeah. or trying something new. And some weeks the audio is wonky, and some weeks it's great. And you know, but we're look, we're we're going through it the best we can, just because we feel like we have to. Yeah, you just can't. And we love it. Don't stop learning. Keep moving forward. Don't and don't look in the mirror unless it's to like learn something from it. Don't beat yourself up and ah, I screwed up. Yeah. And we, keep going. and we feel like like we're here with everybody else. It's not like yeah. it's not like we're here and everybody else exactly. is here. Yeah, exactly. It's like no, we're like like with the people we talk to, we're in awe of these people sometimes. Yeah. And like so we really feel that all of us are in this together and we just mm -hmm. we just happen to be the guys on the microphone, you know. Right. Uh, to have that past experience when we talk to clients on the phone that have greenhouse questions, I love being able to refer back and, and give them advice based off some stuff we did, you know, and some of it, they may have a unique situation. I'll be like, you know what, the exact same happened to me and mm -hmm. it's not in any manual or any yeah. video that even we put out, you know, but you remember that in the time right. and it's nice to have that experience to fall back on. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I guess as we talk about uh, a lot of the exciting things that are going on right now, what do you guys see kind of as the future, maybe in the next five, maybe 10 years of local, smaller scale ag, regenerative ag, what do you, what do you see coming for us? And we kind of touched on it before. Uh, experiences are really important to people. I mean, VR is coming, right? Like yeah. that—that's a crazy experience. Whoa, VR so, on the farm. That'd be, well, okay, okay uh, sure. And, and what are the possibilities <laughs> there? I mean, yeah. you can go down that rabbit hole all day. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. But um, yeah. it's again, it, it's about attention, grabbing people's attention, and that sounds like very Gary V of me or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's it's true. So if you're at the farmers market and you're just standing there. Your booth is very plain, yes, yeah, you're yeah. kind of on your phone. What kind of experience are you about to offer? That the, no, will not sell. No. <laughs> and so, but take that to the other extreme. If you're very engaging and your booth mm -hmm. is crazy, you got some stuff going on or something you haven't seen, or right. you have like a fish tank because it's explaining aquaponics, mm -hmm. well, yeah. you're kind of creating an experience there and that draws people in. So it's like, right. not saying that that's the right answer, but just understanding that when you're selling yourself, you're, you're, you're trying to grab someone's attention, how are you going to connect with them? And so that storytelling, those those human emotions that we're yeah. trying to connect with, what what problem we're actually trying to solve. It's like, you know, you're not just putting, I think it was Seth Godin's thing where 
um, you know, you don't just put a, a nail in the wall because you want a hole. Like you, you, you're trying to hang a shelf. No, mm. you're actually looking for organization. Mm. And so, yeah. you know, that, that thing that's going to hang your shelf is mm -hmm. actually giving you organization. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem you're solving. So, mm. being being more mindful of the words that we're using to connect with customers is ever more popular or important because look, everyone's got access to the same books and the same business courses and stuff, and like mm -hmm. everyone stepped up their game, and so. Mm -hmm. You can't just start a website and think people are going to come to you. You've, mm -hmm. got, you've got to find ways to make you, you know, make them come to you. Yeah, that's a really great point. Yeah, I listen to Gary Vee a lot too. and um, I, like, I love the idea that you know, we're, we're kind of creating intimacy with the customer like we've never been able to do before. And it's, not only is it a good sales tactic, but um, it gives a lot of value to the customer because they get to know exactly what we're doing, who we are, and it also really good about it. Because I, you know, my customers telling me about how their their kids love my, the food that I'm growing, and um, and it gets me more inspired to keep doing what I'm doing. It's just kind of this constant feedback loop, and that's something I've really enjoyed about um, working at the farmers markets or talking to people online or all these things. And all that's brought about through that transparency. You're telling your yeah, story. You're out. Right. You've put yourself out in there. Your customers are doing the same, and mm -hmm. so you. You can look at your customers' feeds and they'll, well, I know that she likes this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. And my other customer likes the same thing. So how do I connect, you know, from whatever they're following back to the farm? Yeah. And you can use the words and the language that they're already using elsewhere on your marketing and help tell your story through things that they're likely to pick up on. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to Brandon's point about coming to the market and there actually being something of substance to enjoy, that should have happened also before. Like, I'm going to the market not to go to the market. I'm going to the market to see Stephen Cornett because of X, Y, and Z that I yeah. saw somewhere else. So that that job doesn't end. Just like I talked about, the sales can be retained 24 hours a day, any day of the week. The same thing about your message. It's we all have virtual stores that we don't now don't have to pay employees to yeah. be the face of our company to be the sales collection mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. give customer service or FAQs. All that's being done by recorded media that's out there, that's accessible, that's at the place that our, our clients are at. Yeah. And uh, it's, again, if you're not doing it, somebody else is going to. Yes. And just like adding some more things in that five-year window, like that personal brand, like you're a really good example of that. Like people know you locally mm -hmm. for what you're doing and that's really helped you. Yeah. And um, an opportunity even stacking on top of that is like with the decentralization that's gone on. Mm -hmm. One thing that I think is a huge opportunity that can really happen is, you know, a lot of grocery stores are now, they'll go food shopping for you. You know, they'll pick out all the stuff and you just pick it up. Right, yeah. But, you know, there's so many local producers now, like farmers doing mm -hmm. value added products. And one thing that we're trying to add on, make available through our subscription service is a locally made grocery. And so yeah, we have a local coffee, we have a local coffee roaster that does yeah. awesome stuff. There's a lady that does goat soaps, it's awesome. And then and honey, it's like you know, all these things. Yeah. It's like if we're already coming to your house delivering all of your meals, and we know a bunch of awesome people making things locally, mm -hmm. we don't we don't need these big grocery exactly. stores. And I so the same thing. Right? There's yeah. such an opportunity there that I just think hasn't like I, my request is for people looking for an opportunity. Like yeah. organize that, make that happen, because yeah. I actually think that would be that's how we localize the national Correct. food supply. Yes, exactly. And that's and Brand is a good example of that actually happening in real time because he's mm -hmm. working with farmers with his store, he's working with other farmers with his delivery. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. it's it's happening. There's an example right there. Right. You know, it, and it's possible, yes. but it takes all of them working together and doing that. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, and that's something that really excites me about the future in the next five to ten years, as all these smaller farmers are coming online, you know, we, now we need all these other businesses and services to come in support of that. So we need, of course, all the restaurants and farmers markets, the, um, the direct uh, delivery food services. We need soil makers. We need compost tea makers. We need, um, we need distribution, uh, distribution and delivery. We need a grocery store that's just right. local produce only. We need, you know, all these different uh, spider webs that are going to go out. 
which we'll bring back and make it all local again. And that That's goes, how we do it. That goes to the next level, like education that like we're all running into now. It's like we're finding out we can't do everything. Yeah. But if we can enroll others in a vision or a, a community where we all have the same goals, well, now we can start working together. It's like, okay, you can handle all of this. Mm -hmm. You'll handle all of that. And we don't all need to be doing the same things all at the same time. Yeah, we're, we're wasting effort in a way if we're all doing like these same things. Like if we could be done centrally, then that takes that task off of us and, and we're giving all this value out to everybody at the same time. And we freed up more time for ourselves to put more value back into our business, to give more value to the customer. And, yeah. and that doesn't happen overnight. No. And so that's why putting yourself out there, building the networks, yeah. it's like we didn't, we didn't just meet each other, we have established trust. Like through, through the proof of what you're doing online, mm -hmm. establishing communication, meeting each other a couple of times, and it's like, okay, now there's trust there. And so now you can like really build like stronger networks instead of just like thinking it's all just going to happen and you're going to do it, right. you know, while so you're So much capable. patience is needed. Yeah, it's a very long game yeah, to get to where we want to go, what we're talking about. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, that's relative too, because it's yeah. only been a few years for me, but mm -hmm. I've just been pretty clear about my vision. Like I, I like really knew what I wanted to do and like goal setting is a huge part of my life. So you can talk about the big goals, but then backing that out into the weekly and the daily mm -hmm. thing. like. I got a main objective for every single day for the next three months. Oh, wow. And that's how I get all this stuff done. And so yeah. I think these things can happen relatively quick, but you've got to be very intentional about your time. Yes. Yeah, and it's, like, not, it's not just one person, it's, it's all of us who are a part of this bigger, larger community. We're all doing that. Yeah, maybe we can steamroll this and really push this out quickly. We need to push it out quickly. So I hope that, you know. And we need micro leaders, yeah. micro leaders yeah. with a shared vision. Absolutely. Um, so I guess just to, to finish up here, this amazing talk with Bootstrap Farmer, to finalize everything, what is the, the impact that you guys want to have with Bootstrap? And um, you know, do you have any future plans that we can get excited about? <laughs> More to come. Okay, okay. More to come. And I'll just say, like, look, we're trying to just, um, like, we're, we're in it. We're, we're through it, and we know what the struggles are, and we know, like, we rely on each other to like learn and to accelerate our growth and all that. And it's like, you're, you're such a resource of knowledge and, and to know you, and, but to know everybody else that's here. Um, our, like, again, with, and we just said, it, it's like, I realize I can't do everything. So in order to have the impact or the greatest impact mm -hmm. that I could possibly make in my life, I need to enroll other people. Yeah. And so, you know, part of why we've collected a bunch of people in Dallas is to, you know, start gaining some enrollment and seeing you, you, you want to create an impact? You want to create an impact? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let, let's all help each other do that. Yeah. You know, because that, working together, we always, it, it's, I don't got to tell you, but mm -hmm. when you work together, the impact you can make is greater than you can do it by yourself. Yeah. You know, and making no mistakes, we're doing this with the intention of doing it with other people that, that we feel like are doing stuff like with what we're doing. Like we're doing this for other people like us. Mm -hmm. We're not doing what we're doing in the hopes of, finally convincing that farmer out there that's always negative and woe is me but won't do anything to fix their situation we're not doing that for them we're just we're trying to be a positive example yeah. Yeah. if some major life changes happen great what we are doing this for is for the farmers that are out there like i've got i've got ideas yeah i just want to help fleshing them out or hey look i'm doing this and it's it's really awesome it's something new in the market mm -hmm. they filled a new void and now they want to share it Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a way for all of us to kind of bring that together and to get with our people and yeah. not only get with our people to work together, like with other farmers and other chefs, but then to find the clients that want this from us. Mm -hmm. And that, that's why we're so adamant about getting out and putting putting yourself out there and getting out and meeting people both on social media and in, in life. I and mean, that's what we're doing tonight. We have a meetup mm -hmm. where it, we in one night for almost zero money, we're gathering a lot of people up together that would have took us years to meet if we were doing it piece by piece. You know, you just have to go, hey, there's a date on the calendar. We're going to be here at this time, at this place. Come on. Yeah. And they did, you know, because we all want to experience that together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, it's fun to have friendships too with other people who, who get it and are doing this same type of work. And yeah, being able to feed off each other, it's just it's fantastic. So thank you guys for putting the meetup together and the you know, doing all this. You know, it, it, to, to that point that you just said, there's nothing wrong with being competitive. Mm 
but there is something wrong with looking at as a competition mindset. And I'm not naive in saying, well, you know, if, if this guy's doing almost something similar, why do it? Like, like, oh, I won't get my extra money for that day. I understand that. But I want everybody to succeed to the level of, hey, I made $100 extra than you did this week. Oh, yeah, well, I did it this week. And back and forth. Right. And by the next time you know, both of these cats are just killing it. Yeah. And they've both upped their game and they've both brought so much to the community that they're trying to serve. Mm -hmm. Again, everybody wins. And it's not because, well, you know, she spits in her soda or whatever, you know, <laughs> you know, you can't do that by, by cutting people down at the knees. Right. You'd be like, all right, I see what you're doing. And instead of taking that negative, negative energy and focusing on what they did or didn't do, I mean, mm -hmm. like, all right, I'm gonna, all right, I got you next week. Mm -hmm. And that friendly competition, yeah, friendly. that competitiveness, that's what drives champions you know Absolutely. and that's not just champions to sit up there and boast but champion to like hey we both did this together we both serve the community and we're both better for it yeah love it well thank you guys so much for sitting down to talk with me i really enjoyed our conversation now, i love what you've done with the place i mean it's yeah. beautiful <laughs> i know right we get, we're between two ferns almost right that's pretty cool so um yeah if you guys would like to learn more about bootstrap farmer go to bootstrapfarmer.com um, check out all our different farming products. I can't recommend them enough. The 1020 trays, um, they've got lights, uh, they've got greenhouses, uh, so many other things as well to check out. Check out their podcast. You can uh, download it um, from any of the uh, it's for iTunes and Stitcher and all the different places that you get your podcasts. 